important. So today I'm hoping to connect some of the information in a way that's meaningful uh, to people so that even in the future you can go back, review this video. There's the information. You'll be able to go to the library. You'll, you'll be able to see this. I'll put together uh, articles that will list everything so it'll be itemized. You can take this to a healthcare practitioner. You can take it to your doctor. You can say, look, this, this is, here's the, here's the science. And not only is many scientific studies that show this is what happens. Yeah. And if at least you don't believe it, look at it because it's there. And many of these studies have been around for years. One of the graphs that I wanted to show today, the website is down, <clears throat> so I don't have that available. And that website is uh, SciTrends, S-C-I-T-R-E-N-D-S dot -E net. And SciTrends is a great site because they track the amount of research that's been done in different fields for as long as that research has been done, I think going back to sometime in the late 40s. And the interesting one, the interesting charts you'll be able to pull up if you look up Candida albicans, you'll see a, a straight line that can go up. And you'll see that continually go up all the way to the present day. Um, and if you look up antifungal therapies, what you'll really notice is there'll be a straight line close to zero around 1949, and then it'll cross over to 1951, and it'll go up to about 400, 500 studies that year on antifungal therapy. And why does that take place? Well, that is when antibiotics were introduced in the late 40s, and they were originally used sporadically, but by 1950, 51, they became very, very popular and everybody started using antibiotics and med medical doctors started using antibiotics. And what they saw shortly after that was a tremendous increase in fungal diseases in, in their patients. There was fungal arthritis, there was fungal um, ophthalmitis, there was fungal endocarditis, so heart fungus, uh, joint fungus, uh, fungus in the eyes. They had uh, an increase in fungal skin infections. They had an increase in fungal sinus infections. They had an increase in fungal vaginal infections and fungal oral infections. So you can see in Cytrends.net where this research jumps shortly after the introduction of antibiotics. Now it's, um, it's not zeroed out in 1949 because Candida has existed for a long time, but it generally existed only in very immunosuppressed patients or very malnourished patients. And Candida was first uh, cited back in the second century by Galen, and I believe in the fourth century by Hippocrates. So go back quite a way. It wasn't until around 1923 that it was really identified as Candida albicans. And most Candida literature prior to then was only Candida thrush or Candida esophagitis. Um, so these are, you'll see the development timeline, but you'll see in side trends how there's a tremendous increase. Uh, another great site that um, maybe we can pull up here is the Entree PubMed site. So this, this is a good site to go if you want to see how many scientific studies have been done on Candida. So once you go to this PubMed site and you enter Candida albicans, uh, there will be a, a search box at the top and you can enter Candida albicans up there and I think we have that live right now. <coughs> and Lisa is typing that in and she'll hit that. Now this is going to give you how many articles have been published and on there, I think there's some 24,567 articles. And below that will give you some 12,000 articles that'll, that theoretically will give you the full article. The 24,567 gives you the abstracts, just a short synopsis of the research. So there's a tremendous amount of research into Candida albicans. Over on the upper right, you'll find the different uh, books that have been published. And below that, you're going to find more of the studies that are more into the genomics, the, the genetics of candida, the proteomics, the protein, the glycomics. So you'll find how that's broken down a little bit and a little bit more specific. So this is on the PubMed site. Uh, PubMed is the National Institute of Health, so it's a government site. And you can see some 24,000, over 24,000 articles. So if we go back to 1949, that means there's more than one article a day for the last uh, 61 years. What was that? Yeah, 61 years. And there's enough left over for another, I believe, six years or so. So that's a tremendous amount of research into Candida albicans. So it's not that there hasn't been research, and it's, and it's all areas. You can look up Candida and mercury, Candida and antifungal drugs, Candida in the body, Candida in the immune system, um, <clears throat> quite a lot of different areas. So there is a lot of science behind Candida. Uh, one of the things I commonly run into is, um, and I believe we'll get into some questions here later, and one of the questions had to do with 
the medical community doesn't really acknowledge candida, um, but there's science behind it. So it's really that they haven't been exposed to it, they haven't been taught uh, that candida exists and, and the enormity of the problem in, in just the general population in, in all the studies show that it's there. Um, and the other part is, is that there's a really a lot of mythology or a lot of bad information or um, kind of word of mouth information which isn't true. So what I find is I'm constantly dealing between people who don't want to accept it and people who have created more stories around it than are actually true or actually backed by science. So we'll, look at, we'll try to look at both of those here today. But again, uh, one of the things I really consider to be the most uh, prevalent cause of candida in the body, systemic candida, which will be the fungal form, is antibiotics. Um, so I want to give you some of the, um, the reasons that I've posted previously on some sites about antibiotics. And first I want to read a, a, a quote um, by Lewis Thomas. He said, uh, who popularized the theory of antibiotic syndrome, which is what happens in the body after you take antibiotics. And he wrote that the microorganisms seemed we, um, the microorganisms that seem to have it in for us turn out to be rather more like bystanders. So he's talking about the 100 trillion organisms that live in the gut. They're just bystanders. They're there. They're breaking down food, digesting food, uh, building our immune system, playing a vital role to our health, an extremely vital role to our health. He said, it is our response to their presence that makes the disease. So it is not that these things create the problem but is that how we treat them and how we respond to their presence that creates the problem. He says, our arsenals for fighting off bacteria are so powerful that we are more in danger from them than from the invaders. Now there's a lot of good uh, science recently. Um, research out of University of Stanford um, shows that uh, through the use of antibiotics, we actually risk short-term problems like diarrhea and life-threatening colitis, inflammation of the colon, which is life-threatening, to more long-term uh, problems like ongoing allergies, asthma, arthritis, and, and then also to implications for cancer and obesity, among other conditions. So uh, some of these new research technologies are bringing out how devastating antibiotics are in the body and the problems that they create. So let's look at antibiotics and specifically with candida. Um, in studying the effects of antibiotics and how they work in the body, I came up with 10, uh, a short list of 10, because there are other mechanisms and other ways we don't even know yet, of how antibiotics are creating problems in the body. Uh, the one that most of us are familiar with are antibiotics destroy bacteria, which means they destroy the bacterial colonies. Thus, they create space for growth of other organisms. Um, and without them, we, we lose what's called competitive inhibition. By their presence is the competition. They take up space, so that prevents other organisms from growing. Um, another, another reason that antibiotics cause problems is antibiotics destroy bacterial colonies that secrete acids that maintain the intestinal pH or the digestive tract in its normal proper range. The stomach is a very acidic tissue. The pH of the stomach is about 1 to 3, uh, very acid. Uh, the small intestine, as the acid is dumped into, uh, from the stomach into the small intestine, is also very acidic, and as you go through the small intestine, it starts to become more alkaline. Uh, but it's more in the range of 4.5 to 6, 6.5. What we find is candida, one of the things that will trigger the growth of candida is when that pH gets up to over 6.5. So that's one of the things that will induce or trigger the conversion of candida in its yeast form to its fungal form, so pH. So we know that antibiotics destroy competitive inhibition and they change the pH, and pH is one of the direct triggers of the conversion of the yeast to fungal form in candida. And again, the yeast form is the normal commensal harmless form, and the fungal form is the pathogenic problematic form, which disperses very easily throughout the body. Um, we have some calls coming in, so here and there I'll be breaking away and taking some calls. Also, three, antibiotics destroy bacterial colonies that secrete acids, and these are fatty acids that inhibit candida's yeast to fungus transformation. One of the main ones is butyric acid. Uh, a good thing to point out here is most fatty acids inhibit fungus. It's one of the main ways that many plants defend themselves against fungus in the natural environment. They secrete these fatty acids. Um, olive oil has uh, an antifungal property to it. Can uh, Coconut oil, another antifungal. But in the digestive system, it's butyric acid. Butyric acid is a fatty acid which protects the uh, digestive tract 
that plays a role. It also protects the lining of the digestive